the other day the Oscars were showing, uh, the Oscar Awards being, you know, the, the gathering together of all the finest films and auteurs in, in the world to celebrate the, the majesty of film and the best art making of the year, right? Oh, you know, yeah, the yeah, the, the finest of the finest. And, and we're looking at films like like Parasite that, that, that push boundaries and, and, and all kinds of amazing films. Uh, and, and it was really a, a night uh, of, of glitz and glamour. Yeah, and my wife, who works in TV and film, was uh, was watching the Oscars and yeah. you know commenting on the, the the artistry and the auteurism of of the of the, the works. <laughs> and right next to her in bed, her husband on his iPhone was uh, with headphones on was watching Starship Troopers. Brad, <laughs> Starship Troopers, one of America's finest films. Another one that pushed boundaries. Another and, uh, film that, that really. The celebration of that film can't be extended far enough. My <laughs> wife watching the celebration of the finest films in the world. Her husband next to her in bed watching Starship Troopers. Wow. Wow. I, it's it's amazing. You know, like when, when a hot front and a cold front meet, is, doesn't that make a tornado? It's amazing that there wasn't like a weather pattern forming between the two of you. I like to think that between my wife and I, it's like the McDLT of artistry. Like she's the, <laughs> when the hot side stays hot and the cold side stays cold. But you put them together, they make a delicious McDLT. And uh, yeah, no, that could not have been a bigger contrast in high art versus crap art. Uh, yeah. Her watching the Oscars and me watching Starship Troopers. Wow. Why, what, what put Starship Troopers on your playlist that night? I mean, they, surely you've seen it before. So you were re-watching it. There was, there was something you wanted to relive in this movie. What was it? Uh, you know what? I actually just wanted to see if the special effects still held up. And oh. the, oddly enough, they surprisingly do for the most part. There's a couple of weak shots where you're like, oh, that CGI doesn't work. But yeah. uh, uh, I mainly wanted to see, because I'm always trying to keep abreast of what is possible within within the budgets of sci-fi so that when I do pitch drive, like mm-hmm. I, I could say, like, this is reasonable, this is not reasonable, this is, you know, this is potentially possible. And anyway... The, the special effects on that movie, uh, for the most part, hold up all right, uh, given the fact that it was made God knows how many years ago. Anyway, the point being, though, it's not a good film, Brad. That was my whole point, was that my wife was watching the celebration of the highest art in the world, and I'm over here watching literally the worst popcorn movie and, and just smiling ear to ear. Well, we had kind of a weird little uh, uh, synonym to that uh, over at the Geiger house. It was uh, family movie night, and uh, we had never seen Toy Story 4. Ah. And we, I saw that it came up on uh, Disney Plus, and I said to the boys, I said, hey, you know, that it, it's, so here's the deal. Uh, when Toy Story 4 first came out, and I saw Forky come across the screen, I, I was like a blackjack dealer. You know, they clapped their hands, we're out. You know, and I'm like, we're done. I'm not watching this fucking Forky. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's going on with this character. He's, he's a spork. I can see he's a spork. I don't want anything to do with him. I'm, I I had a visceral hate uh, immediately towards Forky the character. Okay. And so we didn't go to see it in theaters. So and 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 also the boys said, listen, they did such a good job with Toy Story three. They they tied everything up. They buttoned everything up. It they was did this, really. It had a good bow on it, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. It was it was it was really a satisfying, beautiful conclusion. And my two boys said, there's no way they're not going to screw it up. We don't even want to be there for the train wreck. So we, I'm like, nah, let's put it on for family movie night. Uh, you know, and if it's bad, we'll just, we just flip over to BoJack and get really depressed. So we, uh, we put on Toy Story 4. And I want to tell you, Dave, what a great movie. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was an amazing movie. I mean, I had... It really led to a really deeper discussion. I don't hate Forky anymore, but I I, I don't I certainly don't love him. Uh, but this whole idea that they came across with with kind of like uh, a, a final you know farewell for uh, uh, for Woody, it was just amazing. And I told I told my boys I said you know that's something new that's happening in Hollywood. And you know it, love Disney or hate them, it come it, the trails come right back to Disney. Traditionally in Hollywood, by the time you get to the third ser- sequel, it's cash-in time. They got you to come in for the first two. They know you're going to f- show up for three. And they they pull, it seems like, they pull their budget back. They pull the creativity back. Oh, yeah. Because it's just time to maximize those profits. It's, it's just shy of direct-to-video kind of production yeah. values. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, I said, you know, we, we're, this is the first time that I've noticed this. And particularly, it's, it's, it's odd enough for a number three sequel to be good. But to go past three and have a four and for that to be clearly a movie that they poured all kinds of creative energy into. Uh, and the CGI was a step above again from what we've seen in past movies. Uh, I, I said, this is the, I, the only times you, I've seen that has been in, in, in a, a Pixar movie now and in the Marvel Studios movies where the third sequel is still really brings the sauce. And, you know, there, there was no the, the, the final Avengers uh, being 10 years of sequels, really. Uh, holy cats. It really shows that there's something to be said for, for even going against the accountants and saying, we're going to make that third and that fourth sequel just as good as the first one. And I've never seen that before. Yeah, it's interesting how uh, it, it actually speaks to maybe it was a worthy conversational point, which yeah. is uh, as an artist, sometimes you're going to be presented with a work for hire job or a, um, you know, a temp job or, or a project that you didn't start or, or, you know, or have any ownership over, but you're brought in on. But uh, there are still opportunities to make incredible art in weird situations. You yeah. know? And I, in my own career, especially in my Mattel days, there would be times where I'm like, why are we doing this project? Well, this is weird. But yeah. then you decide, you kind of make a choice of like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to raise my game. And I think uh, um, Disney, uh, I think the contrast here is Frozen 2, which is mm. Frozen 2 did not need to happen as a story. Mm. That was a, Frozen was a complete story. The arc was perfect. Everybody had a satisfying arc. Um, the adventure was a there and back again. And once you were back, it was a completest story. Like you did not need to go back out again, you know? Right. And so it was clearly a cash grab, although there was a lot of love behind it. Like the, the score was, was okay. The, the, mm -hmm. the script was God, actually the script was terrible. I don't know what they were thinking with the script, <laughs> but, um, the voice acting and the animation was beautiful, but it was clearly a cash grab. Disney yeah. was just like, that thing made a ton of money. We're going back to the, we're going back to that. Well, but, right. um, I think Toy Story 4 they probably had enough people on that staff that grew up watching Toy Story, the first one, you know? That's very possible. And so these are probably animators that are in their 20s and 30s going, you know, no, I'm going to work on the love of my life here, and I'm going to make it the best thing I can. Yeah. And uh, the love in that, the, first of all, the script on that story really shown. It was great. Um, and you can't emphasize enough how much it starts. And this is true even with comics. The writing always carries it. If the writing is no good... Mm -hmm. No matter how good the animation or the drawing in a comic are going to be, uh, we'll carry it. Uh, yes. But uh, anyway, um, anyway, uh, yeah, that's uh, on that note, Brad, in terms of our contrasting uh, enjoyment of, of high and low media, I will say hello, everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about making comics. And making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, editor of webcomics.com and cartoonist of Evil Inc., and I'm his friend Dave Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of Stripped. And this week's Hour of Comics Advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave, let's talk comics. Okay, Brad, our first question comes in over from patreon.com slash comic lab. And this is a bit of a personal question. So I think I'm going to err on the side of caution and leave the person's name off. No yeah. need to, uh, to, to get them out in public on this one. But it says, Brad and Dave, a bit of a personal question, but was there ever a time when either of you seriously considered giving up the dream of making comics, whether while still holding a daytime job or while doing comics full time? What fears, doubts, or difficulties caused you to feel this way? What helped you eventually pull out of it? Thanks for everything. Mm. So Brad, this is a big, this is a big mm. picture question, Brad, about yeah. hopes and dreams and fears and... <laughs> and how long you give it and how when do you decide to give up and have you ever decided to give up have you ever had fears of giving up have you ever wanted to quit brad uh yeah this is a really difficult question to, for me to answer because uh i i, I I'll, I'll just say it right on the face of it uh my answer is no i've never considered quitting uh, I, 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 there was a brief period of time where I was really considering going back and, and taking on another day job after I went full time, uh, right. that, that was something that I struggled with an awful lot. Uh, but I, 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 I never have considered quitting. Uh, have you, uh, I don't think so. But I want to I want to frame this better than than what that answer initially implies. So right. I like you 
made, I don't know that I've ever said this to my wife, I'm sure I have, but uh, I made a deal with myself that when I left Mattel Toys and, and started web cartooning full time, that if I or my family ever needed me to go back and get a job, a day job or a second job or whatever it was, mm-hmm. I would, honest to God, Brad, I would, I would go into landscaping. I would do anything to like feed the family, right? Like I don't right. give a shit. I'll, I actually like physical work. Anyway, I don't know why I'm going in that road. Um, I'm perfectly fine. I can you know, get a writing job in LA. Di- the world needs ditch diggers, and it I'm does. just not digger. No, but what I'm saying is, like, I I like work. I don't mind working, and I'm happy to do it. There's a lot of jobs I could do and do well and, it, and derive joy from as a day job. And more importantly than that, if if my family needs food on the table, I'll take the job. Who cares, right? right. Like, So that's, that's the bottom line there. But as far as giving up my dream, I don't think I ever stopped wanting to be a cartoonist. I have always wanted to be a cartoonist since kind of third, fourth grade on have I wanted to be a cartoonist. Right. Um, To an almost singular and stupidly singular direction in the sense that like (laughs) my master's degrees, why did I do those? You know, like that was dumb. Yeah. Well, Um, I don't know that it was dumb, but there were two of them. There were two. Well, (laughs) my, my thought, Brad, at the time was if I can't be a cartoonist, I'll at least be a fallback and be an academic about cartooning. Right, right. And, and then, you know what, at least to have a part of my dream will still be actualized, you know? You'll be in the zone. Yeah, I'll be, yeah, I'll be in that realm. Yeah, yeah, you know, and quite honestly, when you're 18, 19, you operate on thoughts like that, you know? Right. But as far as, I will say this, though, Brad, and maybe you will course correct when you hear what I'm about to say about newspapers. Mm-hmm. I there was a long dark night of the soul when I realized that I was never going to make it into newspapers as a comic strip cartoonist mm-hmm. because that growing up was always my um, promised land. That's yeah. where I wanted to yeah. get to. When I thought about what it meant to be a cartoonist, I wanted to be on the same page as Charles Schultz. Right? Mm-hmm. That's what I physically the same page as Charles Schultz. Yeah. And so when I realized that I never would make it into newspapers. There was about a uh, two to three year window where I got real sad. You know, mm-hmm. I was like, well, I guess that's never going to happen. Well, I'll keep going. I'll, I'll keep plugging away here. But but what <sighs> happened in that same two to three year window is that I realized that for me and for I personally feel for most cartoonists, I feel like the better route is to make your own magic and own and yeah. control your own cartooning career. Oh, and then, yeah. in fact, all the people that I had celebrated that they had gotten a syndicated contract five, six, seven years ago <laughs> were now like, ah, shit, this is not working out like I hoped, right? Right. And so for me, um, it, was a, it was a big change. Yeah. Well, I, 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 it's really interesting that you say that because I had kind of a similar route, although I came to it a lot more uh, 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 gently than you did. In other words, for me, there was no searching of the soul. It was more, and, and it might have been because uh, for quite a few years, I self-syndicated to newspapers. So I had, uh, at one point, I think, by counting up all the circulations of the newspapers that carried it, I had probably a couple of million in potential eyeballs that were looking at my comic. And I was able to see my comic on the printed page. But it, for me, it was it was kind of like, yeah, okay, there it is. But I'm getting pennies for it uh, on the right. dollar. It, it just, I didn't, I didn't have a real big problem with leaving newspapers behind. It, it was kind of like, yeah, there's nothing here. I'm, I'm. It, it, it was a slow dawning for me that I've got it so much better online than I do in newspapers. Well, let's take a different angle on this because it might be more helpful to our questioner yeah. here and others. Which is when you have reached the point, Brad, where you were contemplating giving up. Yeah. I feel like psychologically what you're reaching at that point is, let's just put ourselves in their shoes. Right. I have given everything I have to this dream. I've worked what I think is the peak possible way that I could work within the conditions of my life. Mm-hmm. I've produced what I thought was the best possible work that I could produce within the conditions of my art skills in my life. And it's not happening. It's not clicking for readers. They're clearly yeah. not coming. The income's yeah. not happening. The audience is not growing. Maybe I should just quit. What is that place, Brad? What, what should the person do in that case? <laughs> I'll tell you my answer, but you're not going to like it. Okay. Uh, uh, so I think the person should quit. And I don't mean forever. But I think if you get to the point where there is there is so, such a low return on this that you're like, should I really be continuing this? At that 
point, I think you need to take a step back and not quit entirely, obviously, uh, but hit the pause button and reassess like 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 in a in an adult kind of uh sober way take a really hard objective look at what you're doing across all of the uh variables in other words is this making me happy is this uh gaining traction online is it starting to make money or growing uh financially all of those things that are important right. to you right. as a uh a web cartoonist as a self-published cartoonist uh, I think it's worthwhile to take a uh, a second, at, at pause what you're doing, assess it in an objective way, and say maybe there's something else creative that I can do. That uh, it, maybe it's tangential to comics. Let's say maybe animation, or uh, you know, doing a different type of comic, or doing instead of doing anything visual, maybe just writing or mm-hmm. bringing in a partner or a collaborator. Or just going and taking the, all of those lessons that you learn doing web comics, doing social media, doing creativity, and take it to a completely new area of your life. You know, you can bring yeah. that creativity to a hundred different places. And if you find that one of those places has a better return on investment for you, not only financially, but emotionally and, and mentally, it's better for you then maybe at that point that's a good use of that pause that you that you bring it to something else you'll never have failed if you take what you learned over to that new thing and the thing that i want to reemphasize of what brad just said is the objective look at yeah. um at where you stand because right now uh, emotions, differing emotions, have the tendency to swirl up. And by this, I mean, imagine you're making dinner and you pour four different liquid ingredients into a pot and you start <laughs> mixing them up. They start to feel like they're all one thing, even though the vinegar is very different from the water, is very different from the oil, is very different. From... What I'm getting at is yeah. the sadness that you're feeling right now that it's not clicking, perhaps, or that you're not making money is a very different and distinct feeling from the joy you feel while creating comics. And you need to separate those out because that's important objectively is acknowledge that you're sad about whatever output or reaction it's getting publicly or not getting publicly from the personal satisfaction because that might help you distinguish, as Brad said, when you step back and take a pause, do I want to continue to do this for personal love and joy reasons because I enjoy making the art? Or is it because I only did it because I wanted it to succeed publicly? I wanted mm-hmm. it to be a big public hurrah. You know what I mean? So when yeah. you take a step back, maybe after a month or so of step, stepping away from it, take that objective look at it and try to separate out your emotions of like, am I happy? Am I sad? Am I disappointed? Am I uh, no longer enjoying the physical act of cartooning? Mm-hmm. Do I no longer want to create at all? Do I, did, was, was that maybe a lark that I was exploring that maybe is, is no longer a big part of me? Brad, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, I want to bring this home with one final thought that, honest to goodness, we should have said at the outset. Okay. So when you hear Dave and I say, oh, geez, I've never considered quitting. Never did the thought cross my mind. Uh, that, do- that doesn't mean that if you've considered quitting, that there's something defective with you or wrong with you. Right, Dave, that's true. Dave and I have, are very similar. Let me, let me tell you the full list of all the things I've considered quitting in my life that are not comics. So there we go. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, and, and you know, it, it, there's nothing wrong with you. In other words, sometimes I think we it, it's a strange form of cartoonist machismo where it's like we've got people in our community that are kind of like that, but but very proud. I've never considered quitting. I never had a day job. I never did this. I never did that. And you think, oh, geez, I can't compare to that. I, right, and, right. And, and maybe, I must be less than, yeah. Yes. Don't let that thought cross your mind. Dave and I are, are very similar in, in the respect that we were that weird kid in, in fifth grade or even earlier that I wanted to be a cartoonist and that's all I wanted. And that was the only thing I wanted. There was never a fireman phase. There was never a teacher phase. I never wanted to be anything but a cartoonist. Dave's the same way. Yeah, no, when other kids were reading about astronauts, I was reading about Brad Anderson and Marmaduke going, oh, that seems like a great job. Yeah. You know, yeah. 
And, and if that's not you, that doesn't mean that you're different or lesser than or anything else. It just means that you're your own person and you're walking your own path. And there is a path for you. Uh, and just because it might be different than Dave uh, Kellett's path or Brad Geiger's path doesn't mean it's a bad path. So that's something you got to really understand right at the outset. Uh, walk your own path. Take some time. Be uh, And for the love of God. Be honest with yourself. In other words, if you sit down and write down a list, why am I doing this? And then your first thing is, for the love of comics. Well, look at that sentence that you wrote and ask yourself, is that really why you're doing this? It, it, it's nice. It's the, it's the answer we've all been trained to say. Uh, but if, if you really uh, drill down on why you're doing this, and I encourage you to make that list. Uh, look at those sentences and you can, you can bullshit anybody else, but don't bullshit yourself. Ask yourself, are, they, are these the real answers? And then get down to the real, uh, uh, reasons and, and, and objective, uh, analysis of what's going on there. Well, and before I bring us into our next question, I also just want to put the little capstone on it because it's always worth saying, but be kind to yourself. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, this is a process that uh, we all go through doubts. And even though Brad and I have not necessarily wanted to walk away from comics, you bet your bippy we've both had doubts about stages of our cartooning or are we making the right steps mm -hmm. or, or oh. should I have done this podcast with Dave Kellett? Was this oh, a bad idea? Every, I feel like every I've, week. I've, I've chained myself to a weight in, in bad seas, and this is a, I, I got to get out of this. Surely there was a better cartoonist around Philadelphia that I could have done a podcast with. Why did I do this? But, Listen, you know, I, I send you one little mistake email uh, address to the, that albatross, and you, you take it way out of proportion. It was, it was a misspelling. My fingers slipped on the keyboard. I love that the word albatross could be a misspelling. That was a, that was a Siri miscorrection. <laughs> <laughs> that she, I had said uh, elbow grease, and she she typed it as albatross. I, and... I taped in Dave Kellett, and it came out from autocorrect albatross. And I don't know how it happened. <laughs> I but typed it in Dave Kellett, and it came out my podcast ball and chain. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, here's our next question, Brad. This comes in from Kevin Hunt over at patreon.com slash comic lab. And it says, hi, Dave and Brad. My question comes from an interesting comment about lettering from an interview with a cartoonist who said he couldn't imagine lettering dialogue without reading it out loud first to see where the emphasis or emphasis should go. <laughs> Did you, do you say your dialogue out loud before lettering it? Do you say it out loud as you're writing it? Thanks a lot. Brad Geiger, I asked this question to you from Kevin. Do you say out loud your dialogue as you are writing it or lettering it or putting it on the page? How do you approach your dialogue? No. Now, listen, I don't, I don't, say, I don't say that dismissively. If that's something that you want to do that uh, would help you, or if you've got a tricky a line of dialogue that you're having a hard time getting it to, you know, read correctly on the page, if you want to do that, that that's great. Uh, but if I were to sit here and tell you that I say every line of dialogue out loud uh, before I letter it or as I'm writing it, uh, I'd be lying to you. I. <laughs> I just, that's just not how my mind works. I, I'm, I'm a much more visual thinker and I can make that stuff make more sense on the page than try to convert it from audio to visual. Uh, but maybe I'm weird. Maybe I'm just weird there. Well, I want to say one, this is again, one of the benefits of having Brad on video, uh, when he said, no, I don't want to say sound judgmental, but no, I don't do that. Right. <laughs> but I want you to know that as he's saying, I don't want to sound judgmental. His face was doing, no, Mrs. Ricardo. No. Your face was like this, Brad. No, no, I don't. No, I don't do that. No, no. <laughs> well, I feel like I, both of these questions, I feel like I'm being disappointing in my answer uh, because I'm, I'm uh, shutting somebody down. But I, I, can I be honest with you? I yeah. couldn't imagine working that way. And I, I would I would be annoying to myself. I would be that person on the bus w w listening to their music without headphones. But it would be me doing it to me on my own bus, which is my brain. That's interesting. Okay, well, I will take the counterpoint on this one. Uh, this is something that I do do, not all the time, probably not even a majority of the time, but if there is some chewy dialogue or a transition from panel to panel where I'm like, does this flow? Yeah. Uh, I will do it. And also sometimes I have, let me, let me give you the reverse of this. 
Have you ever had a word that you have read 10,000 times on a page, but when you go to say it out loud, you actually don't know how to pronounce it because yeah. you've never actually said it out loud? So you get the word like aju, but right. you've never actually said it out loud. So you go, I just, I, I, I just, I don't know. <laughs> right. I just, you know, and, and, it's, and that's always kind of dangerous with using words like that. Oh, yeah. But the I guess what I'm saying is the reverse is true, though. I say that as an example so to tell you that the reverse is true. That you can write dialogue mm -hmm. that no one would actually speak that way. Right. Because, because it's on the page and stays on the page, you think, okay, this is naturally flowing language. Yeah. But when you actually read it out loud to yourself in the studio, you're like, no one would say that. Yeah. No one would, would say the distinctiveness of my feelings in this moment are, <laughs> are perpiscacious or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, no one would actually say that. So you have, for me, and again, just for me, um, you have to say it out loud sometimes just to hear that it sounds like real dialogue, you know? Yeah, I would, I would co-sign on that. Uh, it would, it would, it would definitely be something that I would do on an every once in a while basis, but certainly not like I, I really wouldn't do it that often. Uh, but I, I will say this when we're on the subject of emphasis and lettering, I do that. Number one, I do think that you should make use of wisely uh, chosen emphasis words like and, and bolding those words. I, I, I getting so bolding words in lettering is like anything else. It's really useful. It's super good. If you do it in every single word panel, like some of the old Marvel comics used to be done, it loses its uh, its effectiveness because if every word is emphasis, then none of the words are emphasized. So I would I would use it sparingly. Uh, but then when I do bold a word, I'll also bump it up in size as well. In other words, I just don't rely on the, that person that did the lettering font to give me enough bold, I'll also bump it up. And if it's a real uh, emphasized word, I'll bust it right out of the word balloon. If you look at some of the evil links, you'll see that some of the words bounce right out of the word balloon. Well, and another thing, you know, I haven't mentioned this in a long time. This was in a pro tips episode. And by the way, uh, for those uh, Patreon backers, you know that pro tips, we're now approaching 40 hours of podcasts wow. that we've recorded just for Patreon backers. Uh, but I had mentioned this on a pro tip many a moon ago, but I'll re-mention it here. One of my favorite lettering and dialogue tips that a lot of people don't pause to think about is when you're laying out a uh, text for a uh, a voice bubble, or as Brad calls them, what was it, what is it you Word call them? Word balloon is what Word you're balloon. supposed to call them. Sure, sure. Uh, what, uh, yeah, uh, for a uh, word balloon or voice bubble, voice bubble being the better voice one. Bubble. Um when you're uh, when you're lay laying out, remember that English comes with natural grammatical chunks in a sentence. Yeah. And yeah. that you can actually speed and ease the reading process by laying out your voice bubble. So, for example, if I have a, a, a sentence that says, the red dog walks down the street holding his hat, that's three grammatical chunks yes. that you can break up in a voice bubble. The red dog, line break, walks down the street, line break, holding his hat, mm -hmm. end of sentence. And so if you lay it out like that, in English, for in natural English speakers, it's very easy to read because those grammatical chunks are bam, bam, bam. And then yes. you, the, it, it removes one step from processing. You know how they always say, Brad, that white text on a black background requires one more step for the human brain to interpret that because mm -hmm. it's just not a natural way to read text. So yeah. the brain has to reverse it in the, in the mind first and then process the text. Yeah. If you do grammatical chunks in a voice bubble, it removes one step that the brain has to do which is to parse out how this sentence is naturally going to break down. So uh, I, I know this is not part of the questioner, but it's just a little tip there on, on laying out your dialogue in a voice bubble. Absolutely. And all too often, if you're just drawing, like if you're doing Adobe uh, software for your lettering and you just draw that rectangular word balloon, you could get breaks uh, happening at any different places just based on that, uh, that, that text box that you drew in Adobe. So you could get the red dog walked down the street with you see word balloons like that constantly right. in pro-am comics where it's like oh come on bring it bring, bring it up just a little bit think about what you're doing yeah just it, it literally it only takes another minute or two but the the reading process is so much improved on that hey 
If you're listening while you work, take a minute and stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, Brad and I are going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. Yeah, because, you know, when you do, you'll get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And an exclusive Patreon post that go even deeper on the Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, no worries. You can still support the show by rating us wherever you get podcasts. Leave us a five-star review and a few kind words. And that, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. And now, let's talk comics. All right, Brad. Well, our next question comes in from Eric Campling over at patreon.com slash comic lab. And it says, Dave, Brad, Brad and Dave, a social media question. I read a comment recently that a creator who copies and pastes the same posts across platforms doesn't understand social media because each platform is for fundamentally different kinds of engagement. And cross-posting means at least some of the platforms are being used wrong for any given post. Number one, is the aforementioned commenter correct? Two, and if so, what is the right way to use each platform most advantageously? Look at that word, advantageously. <laughs> See, that's what I mean about a word that you would write, but you would never say out loud. No one yeah, says no advantageously. One says advantageously. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest, Imgur, Imgur God, I hate that, Flickr, <laughs> DeviantArt, and are there platforms as creators we should prioritize or abandon? Oof. So, Brad, this is a this is two questions in one. First, let's start off with the with a primary idea. Yeah. Are is are, is a creator in the wrong if they write one post and then use an IFTT, for example, to yeah. post it across, post it across multiple different platforms? Is that a bad idea? Finally, a question that I can answer unequivocally yes to. Yeah. Listen that's... to that Brad Geiger positivity. <laughs> that <laughs> patented <laughs> Brad Geiger positivity. Always a yes. He's a yes man. <laughs> yeah, that's a horrible idea. And it's why I don't use uh, uh, software like, uh, what is that? If this, then that. IFFTTTT. Uh, I don't use that. I don't use Jetpack to automatically post to social media for exactly that reason. Each one of those social media platforms, as Eric rightly points out, has its own little uh, 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 mores and norms and uh, tweaks. And and there's there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to that. So putting one uh, post out, to all these different social media, you might as well be just throwing, you, you, you're wasting your time. You might as well not be doing it, in my opinion, uh, because uh, Twitter is going to, uh, let's just take hashtags as a for instance. As a for instance, uh, Twitter, you, you, if you get too many hashtags on there, uh, people kind of roll their eyes at it, I think, and, and they start to back away from it. One, maybe two hashtags on a Twitter post, and, and you're just fine. Instagram. You can go, you, you need hashtags or else you're not going to get seen. So now you're talking about anywhere from 8 to 30. And there's all kinds of approaches we've talked about on the show before for, uh, you know, kind of finessing your Instagram hashtags. Facebook, I'm, I am personally convinced that Facebook throttles any posts with hashtags on them. They don't want to see them there, is my opinion. So you don't want any hashtags, or at least I don't want any hashtags, on a Facebook post. Imager, you get five hashtags on that one. Uh, DeviantArt, I, honest to goodness, it's been such a long time since I've looked at that. I don't even know if they've got hashtags. So, so ju And that's just one example. And we can extrapolate that to whether you're posting a full comic or a panel-by-panel -panel swipe. Or, a, a, or if you're saying something about the comic and what sort of things. If I'm saying something about my comic on Instagram, it's about the process. I really enjoyed the inks I put down on this. I, I got a certain line quality on this that I really liked. If I'm putting it on Facebook, I'm saying something totally different about it. I might be talking to the community. If I put it on Twitter, I might be pointing out, I might be asking a question of the people that are seeing it to generate some engagement. I'm going to, I'm going to, the comment that I put on that is going to be a little bit different for each one that I put up on yep. each social media. So the short answer is Eric, absolutely. That's the bad way to go. Well, and I, I, I think there's not much I can add to that actually, because Brad summarized that so perfectly. Uh, I will say though, um, with the second one, uh, I have tended to, for my own personal and subjective reasons, tended to focus on, 
uh, Twitter and mm-hmm. Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, Twitter because uh, Twitter enjoys a good witticism, a good turn of phrase. And so a lot of comics do well on Twitter, but the user base is inarguably uh, smaller than other platforms, right? Yeah. So you just have to go into that knowing that Twitter is, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but, but much smaller. Uh, Instagram, the growth is ridiculous on Instagram. Um, and I am still on the fence about whether I can ever make use of it. Um, uh, you know, like how can I turn uh, 40,000, 100,000 readers towards my website? It's much harder on Instagram, Mm -hmm. but I'm trying it. Uh, Facebook for my own personal subjective reasons, they've just burned my trust uh, too many times. And so even though that user base is ridiculously huge, I just personally, this is a personal one. I, I can't use it anymore. in in terms of, uh, their frankly betrayal of public trust in a couple different ways. Yeah. Um, again, that's a bad business decision. But for me, it's a good personal decision. And so that I don't I don't put my own subjectivity on you uh, folks for that. That's that's my own uh, decision making. But um, uh, and then Brad uses Im, Im, Jer, Im, Jer, whatever that damn name <laughs> is. Imager. That's two guys in a dorm room came up with that I name. Know. That's the worst I name. Imager. Uh, Im, Imager or Imger? Im- well, uh, there's an ongoing, it's like GIF and JIF. There's there's an ongoing debate on the right way to pronounce it, and nobody's ever come up with a definitive one that I know of. Uh, it's it's too clever by half. Yeah. Anyway, um, uh, Brad uses that one, and uh, and I don't think you or I have ever done deviant art, uh, mainly because that came of age when we were at a different phase of our life, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I think had we been in our teens or early 20s, we would have been on deviant art. I don't think, I don't personally find anything wrong with it. Um, uh, but go ahead, Brad. You had a th- there was there was about five minutes when Tumblr uh, kicked all the not safe for work artists off of Tumblr. For five minutes, everybody uh, determined that we're just going to take all our stuff and go over to DeviantArt, and uh, it, it, so it had like a big splash. But then I don't really think it took uh, root, and then it kind of fizzled out. So I, I posted some new stuff on DeviantArt and got such a low return uh, for that that I I never came back. But I'll put one final capstone on this. And this is the honest to God. It puts a little bit of the onus on you uh, to do take a minute and, and write down a list of 20 of your favorite artists in Excel mm-hmm. and make a little grid saying, OK, Brad Geiger, where does he post? And then go everywhere on all those different platforms and see who posts here. See who posts there. Where yeah. does Dave Kellett go? Where does I don't know. I'm picking out names from the hat. Where does Jeff Jacks go? Where does Hannah Hillam go? Where does uh, Dylan McConus go? Mm-hmm. Uh, make a list of 20, 30 artists and and find out where they're posting and that'll help advise you in a way far better than I could individually do, um, uh, tell you where to go. So, uh, a little bit of that onus is on you on that, but, but good luck with it. Brad, any final thoughts? Yeah. And as far as what's the right way to use each play platform most advantageously, uh, we've talked about that on for two years. <laughs> you, 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 we can't put it all in one place, but we've been talking about that for a long time. And and uh, yeah. it, uh, the uh, the end result is very similar to what Dave just got done saying, and that is you've got to you've got to do that. There are some things that we can tell you, uh, but the best way to master social media is to pay attention. Pay attention to what's working. Pay attention to what doesn't. Because, for example, I could tell you today, you got to use 30 hashtags on Instagram. And then they change their algorithm. And now, these days, I'm posting closer to eight because 30 really was not working for me. So you've got to constantly, like Dave says, keep your head on a swivel and keep looking. It's not really worthwhile to ask us. We can give you some tips. We can give you some hints. But you're going to be most invested in pay attention to yourself and find out what's working for you. And part of that is, and this, Brad, I promise this will be my final capstone on this. Part of that is you have to live on that platform for a little while. Yeah. So that list of 20 or 30 cartoonists, start following them on their different platforms and Mm -hmm. see how they approach it. And you'll start to get a feeling for, okay, this is welcome on this platform. Oh, this is clearly a different culture. And this kind of thing is more welcome on this platform. Or when this cartoonist does it this way, oh, they seem to get a good reaction. Okay, I'll incorporate that into how I do it. But sometimes that's a learning process. It's a one to six month learning process. Um, you can't just like jump into, I don't know, uh, deviant art and have it down immediately. There's a bunch of weird little subsets, as we all know, on, in- on Instagram, on Twitter, on Imager and all that stuff. And so it just takes a little bit of a learning curve. But, um, but good luck with it. And, uh, and I think uh, you're off to a good start there by asking that question. 
All right, Brad, our next question comes over from Steve Thomas over at patreon.com slash comic lab. It says, hey, Dave and Brad, since you guys are such huge fans of Wacom, I wonder if something like this article about their privacy policy gives you pause. And then he links to an article from robertheaton.com, and the title of which is Wacom Drawing Tablets Track the Name of Every Application You Open. And then he says, look forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, basically, uh, uh, a programmer, Robert Heaton, had discovered that Wacom uh, tracks the applications you open and sends it to Google An- Google Analytics. I can say Google. It's only been around for 20 years. And, and sends it to Google Analytics to be aggregated as data. Um, and uh, that link will be over on our patreon.com slash comic lab page. It's too long to say on a on a. Uh, a podcast but brad what are your thoughts about this uh wacom as a tablet is apparently doing um uh, tracking of what um applications you open thoughts concerns possibilities problems uh well okay so let's put this right up at the top uh wacom was a longtime sponsor of ours in 2019 they're not a sponsor currently uh however that doesn't mean that they won't be a sponsor again in the future uh, and maybe after hearing this podcast, they won't be a, <laughs> won't be a uh, uh, a sponsor. Who knows? Uh, but uh, we do need to put that right at the top. Uh, however, let me tell you this: sponsorship or no, I think this is on the on the grand list of things to be upset about. For me, it's a complete non-issue. So here's here's the deal. This came across my social media feed a while ago. And so I read it uh, at the site that uh, Dave was talking about, and it came down to, uh, from what I could see, two main reasons that the writer was trying to convince me that I should be upset. And the first was that any taking of data is bad. It's just an overall privacy issue. I should not be uh, handing over any data whatsoever. And the second was, uh, the example that he used was, what if the Wacom user were working on a not yet announced video game? What if a Wacom employee suddenly started seeing entries spring up for Half-Life 3 test build? Would Valve, the company that owns the Half-Life IP, be concerned? Uh, I don't see, okay, so first of all, uh, on the first one, yeah, I think any any taking of data, you have to definitely be a little bit concerned about. Yeah, you set it's up and take notice. Yeah, yeah it, it's something that you do need to know about. It, it's something that uh, is is concerning. Uh, but when I take a look at what's actually happening, I, I kind of get it. Of course, I it, for me, I kind of want Wacom to know what applications are being used with their equipment. So because I I would want them to know that, for example, there's an awful lot of people using uh, Clip Studio Paint and what could they do to make their equipment work better with CSP or Photoshop or InDesign or whatever have you. So I kind of get why they want that information. uh, And I I honestly don't mind that they're collecting it. And, And as far as, you know, working on a top secret project, I, I I just don't know that that's uh, one of my real world concerns. But what I do have to say is when I take a look at the the, the outrage over this, it, it it's kind of silly to me because you and I, Dave, and everybody listening to this podcast have both hand waved so many terms of service agreements that we've clicked that we have read and understood them without barely taking time for the screen to load on our monitors that it's kind of weird for us to all of a sudden for us to be pretend to be worried about a list of applications and I'll tell you exactly what I mean consider the fact that nearly every social media account that you launch is has a terms of service agreement similar to Instagram where it says, uh, quote, Instagram does not claim ownership of any content that you post on or through the site. Instead, you hereby grant to Instagram a non-exclusive, fully paid, royalty-free, transferable, sub-licensable, worldwide license to use the content that you post through the service. Now, you and I both know, Dave, what that actually means is Instagram is going to use those rights to post your stuff uh, on their services uh, wherever those services may be used, right? Right. It, right? We've kind of gotten over panicking about that. But 
those words are still there. It does leave the door open for certain things to happen with mm-hmm. those rights. Mm-hmm. The chances of that happening are infinitesimally small, but those words are still there, right? right, right. We don't give that a second thought. We don't even, we, we, we click those terms of services away so quickly, we don't even think about it. Uh, it, it and, and, and it's because in the same way that web comics were never free, they were ad-driven, right? Social media isn't free. It's you're paying for Twitter by giving them your data. Right. And you're doing so willfully. Right. You're paying for Facebook by giving you are making your data. yourself an ever more targetable advertising target with yes. every Twitter post and every Instagram post and everything that you like or look at or linger on. Right. All of that is trackable. But OK, so I, I'm going to offer a counterpoint to you on this, which is that mm-hmm. I do. I wish that this wasn't happening with a Wacom tablet. Yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the sense that I I am growing increasingly frustrating with the Internet of Things and everything reporting back to its maker that, hey, this light bulb got turned on 14 times today. Do yeah. they need to know how often I turn on the damn light bulb? <laughs> does, does Amazon have to report back to everything? Does does Siri have to report back? Like, it, it does bother you once you start to think about the fact that your TV, like, uh, I, I recently bought a Samsung uh, TV, mm-hmm. and the damn thing reports back what uh, what you watch on it and where yeah. how long you last and, and how long you linger, and it's sold to third parties and to advertisers. And you have to go in and turn all that off, and it bugs me. So I do share this programmer's frustration that what is essentially a really expensive, very well-built um, art tool mm-hmm. is reporting back what um, applications are opening. But having said that, Brad, I also know that because it's a very well-built, finely tuned, programmed uh, device, it's not a pen that has one part that's pointy and one part right, that's smooth. Right. Um because it's way more than that, they have to know that a lot of people are using CSP or people using the new. Uh, do we still need to support Photoshop 2.0? Nope. It looks like none of our user base right. is there, so we no right. longer need to support that. Um, do we need to start supporting CSP? Oh wow, look at the user base is really rising on that. So yes, we need to start working out the the regularities of how that works and the and the and the little specificities of how that works. Yeah. So yes, I will agree with you that much like Apple does when you log on to a new computer, it's like, do you want to report back problems? Do you want to report back hiccups? And you can and opt out. Um, I wish that uh, Wacom would let you opt out in a more clearly defined way right up front and say, hey, we know you're starting up. Here's our privacy in, in terms of uh, use. Uh, do you agree? Yep, great. Would you like to opt out of reporting back your programs being reported? Uh, yes, I would, actually. Uh, that, to me, would be a small but critical step that I would like. But mm-hmm. it turns out that there is a way to turn it off in um, once you've got your Wacom tablet up and running. You can then open up the Wacom Desktop Center and disable what's called the, quote, Wacom Experience Program. Mm. Um, and so there is a way to turn it off. I just wish it was more upfront. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. In other words, if you had found out about it through Wacom instead of through uh, this website, this, this person discovering it, it would be a little bit more palatable. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, uh, listen, I'm also going to be honest about it. Do I care? Not really. But yeah. I, I know that there are people who uh, out there who really do care. And the fact is society needs those people to really care because mm-hmm. eventually they will stumble upon some terms and conditions that will are all like, oh, thank God somebody was looking, you know? Right. Like, right. I'm not that person. I'm not that type A or OCD about terms and conditions. But thank God those people are out there because every once in a while they stumble upon some gem and we're all like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, Wait yeah. a minute. What did I agree to? Hold on. Oh, yeah. Because well, that, you know, was, lawyers... that was exactly what happened with uh, Tapastic uh, a few years ago, where they changed their terms of services uh, and kind of gave themselves right of first refusal for anybody that used uh, oh, right. the Tapas. I remember that, yeah. And uh, it, like I scrammed after that. And 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 it there was, was also like, that it... uh, web comics contest. Do you remember about fifteen years ago, yeah. twelve years ago? I don't remember what it was called. But they had really exclusive first right of refusal rights to whoever, quote unquote, won the contest. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of people at the time going like, please don't enter this thing. Do not (laughs) do not join this contest. Yeah. So you're right. We do need people that are vigilant like that. Uh, But but again, there was there was certain elements where it felt like stirring up drama. For example, as you kind of alluded to, uh, he says, well, Wacom is just basically like a mouse. And if you read that without any critical thinking and go along with it, then you sign off on a lot more things that come after that as logical conclusions. 
Uh, to, to say that Wacom is basically just a mouse is kind of disingenuous. And, it, and it's being used so that you'll follow along with the, like, well, what could they possibly want uh, that, my, that my mouse uh, doesn't seem to need? And that it felt like it was trying to kind of drum up the drama. Uh, but, but in general, I will sign off on what you said. We do need people like that. Uh, we do need people that are looking at that and giving us little reminders to, uh, to look at what we're agreeing to online. To that end, I'll point you to a uh, post I made way back in 2012 on webcomics.com. Uh, there's a website out there called Terms of Service Didn't Read. It's at T-O-S-D-R dot org. And you can go through and do a search for all these free uh, uh, apps and sites that you use, such as Twitter and uh, DeviantArt and so forth. And it'll tell you in easy to understand language what those terms of services you agreed to are. It's a really useful site. And if you and if you are interested in protecting some of the data you're throwing around there for using these quote unquote free sites, check out TOSDR.org. Yeah, and remember that most any service or object that you buy, uh, the terms of service almost inevitably offer an out like they do here with the, in, in the conversation with this Wacom thing where you can mm -hmm. turn off that tracking. Because uh, when you're opting for a free service, like Brad said, you yourself are the product, right? And so there's no way right. they're going to let you opt out of giving that information because your information is the product. That's what's paying yeah. for it to be free. But when you buy an Apple computer, when you buy a Samsung TV, or when you buy a Wacom uh, uh, tablet, of course they're going to let you opt out of it because you've just paid $2,000 for the damn thing. And so they're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's fine. You can opt out. Yeah. Um, but I, I also understand from a quality control standpoint, like Brad said, they need to know what programs to support. They need to know the frequency and the, and the, um, the intensity of the use and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, so yeah, the short version is, do I really care? No, but if you do, you can go into and turn off, uh, as I mentioned, that Wacom experience program in the same way that if, if like me, you've bought a Samsung TV, you can go on and just turn off the <laughs> damn Wi-Fi to that TV so it can't talk to anything, which is what I've done. Um, yeah. Uh, so, and that's that. It's not a fun topic, but it's something, it is something that if you're, if you're at all cynical about the world, you do need to be a little bit, uh, suspicious of, but as mm -hmm. Brad say, Brad says, have it within uh, context of how much you have already signed away in terms of your privacy yeah. with the truly egregious ones like Facebook, for example. I, I know that's twice now I'm, I'm bagging on Facebook on the show, but I really, I just <laughs> well, don't like them as a fair. company. I think, I think that's a fair bag. So do we have time for one more question, Dave? We do indeed. All right. Here's one uh, that comes in. It says uh, from uh, Kevin McGinnis over from patreon.com slash comic lab. And it says, hi, guys. Thanks for what you do, both in your own work and for web comics as a whole. I know Bradley J is all about getting everything streamlined to maximize outreach, which means simplifying things like comic panels for cross-platform flexibility. While I respect the pragmatism, do you think it sacrifices the creative format potential that is comics? Thanks, guys. You spend more time in my kitchen than you know, not euphemistically. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess this one comes down to me. And, uh, I, and how I much you're be, phoning it in, Brad? Apparently, yeah, uh, yeah. The, 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 the subtext here is that I'm phoning it in and I'm, I'm sacrificing <laughs> a lot of my uh, creativity for pragmatism. Uh, it, <clears throat> I got to be honest with you, it was hard not to be insulted <laughs> by that question uh, because my initial response is to say, would you please go to evil-comic.com and look at my page designs and I'll, 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 hold, I'll stand behind those all day. In other words, if you can look at what I'm actually posting there and say that I'm, I'm sacrificing creativity for pragmatism, I've got I, I've got some of the best uh, page compositions that I've ever done. I've got including circular panels that straddle the gutter between two other panels. Uh, probably some of the best word balloon use uh, that I've used. Uh, I, I'm really proud of where I've gotten and what I've built uh, my skills to be able to do. And uh, the, so so this whole idea that that I've been sacrificing creativity for pragmatism. I, I, I'd love you to go and look at my stuff <laughs> and then come back 
and tell me that I'm sacrificing uh, anything. Uh, because yes, I do have to make some, uh, I do have to uh, plan for it. But I don't know that I'm sacrificing uh, any creativity. Uh, and, and, and secondly, there's a part of this that we do need to talk about. And that is this. There are always uh, limits, structures, formats uh, that, that, that determine what we do as comics. In other words, to assume that there, there's, there was no limits on newspaper comics is crazy. They, they had limits. They could only be a certain size. They could only go so far. They could only, they could only have a certain number of panels. Uh, same thing for comics that appeared in magazines or comic books. Uh, same thing for the early web comics. See, we can talk about the infinite canvas all we want, but for an awful long time, nobody, uh, due to load uh, uh, speeds and, and everything else, uh, you know, those, those were impractical. Yeah. So go I'm ahead. I'm going to jump in actually and support this point because. Let's all think about that beautiful, infinite scrolling comic that we all know and love. Ah, oh, that one that was groundbreaking and changed culture. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. It doesn't exist because it never yeah. got popular because it needs to be able to be read by many people on many different platforms. Now let's talk about Peanuts. Charles Schultz limited it down to, to four squares that could be stacked, yeah. they could be horizontal, or they could be put into a square. was reprinted in thousands of newspapers around the world and was a mm-hmm. culture-changing event. Now, which one uh, was more, quote-unquote, pragmatic because he made a, a functional choice for that comic? It was Charles Schultz. But which mm-hmm. one had the greater cultural impact because he, that one small decision, the, the quote-unquote, pragmatic decision— enabled that art, that creativity within it to shine. Like it, it, yeah. he basically accepted one or two limitations, which by the way, to Brad's point, every art form does. We all have limitations. Mm-hmm. A novel writer has to accept limitations in the same way that a poem writer has to accept limitations. Right. In the same way that a sculptor has to accept limitations. Every art form has limitations. But the creativity comes in saying, all right, I'm setting myself this limit that when I create this book, Watchmen, I have to create every page such that could fit in a grid of nine or it could be a full page. You know what I mean? Like, you remember how the the page layouts for Watchmen were very specific and had to fit that specific page format. Well, Mm -hmm. guess what? They produced one of the most groundbreaking graphic novels in the world, uh, even with those pragmatic page layout choices in place. Because that is not necessarily the creative outlet. That's just the rules that bind it. And then the creativity is set free within there. I I know that sounds counterintuitive, but Mm -hmm. if you allow yourself completely blue sky um, uh, limitations, what I I have found with uh, my own art making and with friends is that sometimes the art doesn't get made or gets made weird because uh, the limitations sometimes are instructive and helpful to letting the art come to life, to come into fruition. Do you know what I mean, Brad? Right. Maybe right. that maybe that doesn't make sense, but maybe you no, can say that's that. No, it's exactly Brad. what I'm saying. When uh, the, when you apply those limitations, uh, let's let's say that I, that I even applied more limitations than I'm um, right now doing for myself. Uh, that would oh, it, that would not decrease creativity. That would increase my need to be more creative. In other words, uh, I I have to be creative to work within limitations. Right. Right. So I, I, I just don't. <clears throat> I number one, I don't accept the premise that I've sacrificed anything in that original graphic novel version, uh, because I really haven't. Uh, but uh, the secondly, I, 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 I just kind of reject this idea that uh, that there's there's a uh, there's a <laughs> that this limitation means that I'm I'm delivering less. I think you can do everything that you used to do and still do cross-platform publishing. Yeah. I mean, uh, let's let's accept a, a basic here that, like, if you want to do cross-platform publishing, it does mean that your platform, your panel considerations change a little bit, right? Like, you're not mm-hmm. going to do a long, thin horizontal because that doesn't necessarily work cross-platform. Mm-hmm. But uh, find a way to work around that. Is there a way to draw that that panel as a series or as a as a as a different format that could work amazingly? You'll find yeah. a way, and in so doing, it'll work great uh, and reach a broader audience. Um, I don't I don't find because maybe I've been doing comic strips for twenty years now. I don't find limitations all that much of a threat to my art making, Brad. If you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. I actually find it. Uh, kind of fun like okay dave here are the 20 rules of comics now go make an idea work you know right like right. the voice and bubbles have to go at the top they can't that. go at the bottom 
The yeah. panels are square. Don't make them into the shapes of stars. You know, like whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, uh, the comics have a bunch of, and you're not even thinking of them, but the comics have a bunch of unwritten rules about how they work. Gutters have to be, you know, uh, roughly the, the the width of a letter width, you know, whatever it mm-hmm. is, whatever rule you want to express. Yeah. Um, those limitations help you take an idea without having to re-explain or re-establish a whole new world or way of communicating, uh, i.e. infinite scrolling comics. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the idea can shine and not the medium shining, you know? I don't know. Right. Um, so anyway, I'm not worried about this. I, and, I, and, and like Brad, I find that the pra- pragmatic choices, because remember, pragmatic as a word is just making a realistic and sensible choice versus blue skying it, right? That's what pragmatic mm-hmm. means. Um, and so I think a lot of comics are um, a, a realistic and actionable way to express an idea. Um, how can one artist working alone in their studio produce an idea on a regular basis to an audience? and share it with as, with as wide as possible audience uh, as effectively as possible. So I think comics work brilliantly for that very reason. Um, and so I don't, I, don't, I don't get nervous about that limitation. Yeah, I think that's a great way to uh, end it. And, and while we're here, let's say this. You've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been my friend Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the cartoonist of Evil Inc. at evil-comic.com. And my friend Dave Kellett, co-director of Stripped and cartoonist of Sheldon at Sheldon Comics and Drive at Drive Comics. And the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. If you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and you may hear your review featured on a future episode. Comic Lab is made possible by your support on Patreon.com slash Comic Lab. So we'll go ahead and say that twice. Patreon.com slash Comic Lab. Mm-hmm.